Imagine lying like this, unable to move your legs, surrounded by strangers, naked. How would it feel? This is lithotomy position, and this is how more than a quarter of a women in the country give birth. My name's Florence. I'm an obstetrician, a doctor that specialises in pregnancy and birth. This is a normal occurrence for me to see a woman in stirrups like this. Sometimes lithotomy is used because we need to assist with the birth. But sometimes its use can be habit. It's more convenient for us as caregivers than some of the positions a woman might naturally adopt. One year on NHS change day, I hit upon the idea of the lithotomy challenge to try and understand what it would feel like from the woman's perspective, literally. I wasn't naked. I wore a hospital gown with shorts underneath. And to try and make it as realistic as possible, I strapped a fetal heart monitor around my middle and stuck a drip to my arm because women often complain they feel tied down by our equipment. I needed the help of a midwife to get into position, as it's impossible to do yourself. I felt exposed despite my clothes, and I felt uncomfortable. I couldn't imagine what it would feel like with a baby bump too. My whole torso already felt compressed. Staff came out of curiosity to peer into the room. I noticed they talked to the midwife, not me, almost as if I wasn't a person but an exhibit. Now and again, I repeat the lithotomy challenge with students and staff. They're often reluctant and embarrassed, but for those that are willing, they find it eye-opening and appreciate just how vulnerable and exposed a mother-to-be can feel in this position. Giving birth should be special. It's a transformational experience. The baby is a brand new person starting out in the world, and the woman becomes a mother, taking on a new role and identity. Yet sometimes maternity care can end up feeling more like a busy factory production line than a personal, individual experience. Caesarean births now exceed 30% of total births. In theatre, women lie exposed immobile, surrounded by unfamiliar faces in an alien clinical environment. And in the situation where a general anaesthetic is required, both parents effectively miss the birth of their child, one unconscious, one shut out. Looking at birth as a unique life event, how is this acceptable? There's never been a more challenging time in maternity services with numerous existing reports of services failing families with more underway. We're facing unprecedented scrutiny and staff shortages. A consistent theme is that of women not being listened to or not believed. It's now seven years since the spotlight turned on NHS maternity services. Why are we still floundering? Recent surveys of women's experience of maternity care demonstrate little, if any, improvement. Is it any wonder we're seeing an increasing proportion of women requesting a planned caesarean birth as a means of taking back control? Colleagues already saw me as an honorary midwife, but it was the birth of my children that gave me an additional interest in improving maternity experience. It was Christmas, 1998. I was pregnant with my first child. I was way overdue, the last in my antenatal class. When my waters broke, I was excited. Finally, things were underway. But at the hospital, I was given a deadline. In 12 hours, if I wasn't contracting and my cervix wasn't dilating, I would have to be induced given a jump start with a hormone drip. I was stunned. I didn't want induction. 
I wanted time. I sat up all night contracting, willing myself to go into labour. The next day, informed I was only two centimetres dilated, I reluctantly did as I was told and had the drip. They pressed me to have an epidural, a pain relief injection first, but I refused. I didn't want one. I wanted control over something. I wanted a choice. Hours later, exhausted, I gave in. I had that epidural, but it didn't work properly. And they didn't believe I could still be in pain. Finally, more than 24 hours after my waters broke, after contracting day and night with no sleep, still only three centimetres dilated, they said I needed a caesarean. Failure to progress, they called it. Beaten, I felt disembodied on the operating table, as if I was looking down on myself, an object surrounded by people. I no longer cared about my baby. I didn't even want to look at her, let alone hold her. A poor, yet not uncommon experience, more than a third of women experience induction of labour. Nothing unusual happened. I was just a statistic, one of the many run-of-the-mill emergency caesareans considered a good clinical outcome for mother and baby. I had a healthy daughter, but I had felt disempowered and helpless, unable to speak up for myself, despite my professional expertise. One of the key features of obstetrics is not one patient, but two, mother and baby. Traditionally, we're taught the mother comes first, but in recent years, I feel the balance has been tipping. Yes, of course, we want a healthy baby, but this isn't the only important outcome. We've made great strides forward in achieving and surpassing the national targets in reduction of stillbirth and neonatal death. But in our efforts to achieve a healthy baby, are women's experiences being overlooked? We're seeing increasing rates of birth trauma with around 20% of women, that's around 120,000 women a year experiencing some symptoms of trauma, such as nightmares, flashbacks, and low mood. Are we causing physical and psychological harm to women through increasing intervention and imposition of medical guidance? I'd spent two years blaming myself for being unable to give birth to my daughter. I wanted another shot, a chance at a different, better birthing experience. This time, contractions started in the garden, sitting on the steps with my toddler. I let them build. By the time I went to hospital, I was already three centimetres dilated. They offered me a birthing pool. It was wonderful, warm and soothing. I floated. I breathed the gas and air. I got the giggles. I felt relaxed and in control. Later, after 24 hours with little progress, I agreed cesarean was safest. I went into theatre. The anaesthetist was brilliant, kindly distracting me with football chat, and my second daughter was born. I held her in recovery. I had no regrets. The experience was cathartic, reparative almost. I'd had my chance. I'd felt listened to, supported and believed at every point. Yes, the clinical outcome was the same, an emergency caesarean, but my births felt like chalk and cheese. They could not have been more different. Evidence tells us for women with a straightforward pregnancy, having a second or subsequent baby, home birth is the safest hospital birth, and in some respects, possibly safer, with reduced chance of complications for the mother without a negative impact on the baby. As an obstetrician, I understood the data, but not the experience. 
In clinic, I would only meet women planning home birth when a problem had been flagged and they'd been sent to see me. Or women transferred in by ambulance when things had gone awry. To understand more, I arranged to follow the home birth team midwives. Roles reversed when labour started. It was me, the professional, frantically driving, trying to find my way, worrying if I would get there in time or if I would find parking. When I arrived, I was invited in by the grandmothers waiting expectantly in the kitchen. I'd underestimated the difference of going into someone's home. We were the visitors, joining the mother on her terms as she made herself comfortable in her bedroom. This had a significant impact on the power balance, putting her in control. There was no interference, no interruption. The midwives and I were caregivers in an intensely intimate experience. When the baby arrived, it felt incredibly right. He was already home. Afterwards, the elated and exhausted mum settled into bed and we had a carpet picnic, chatting and supporting her through those first few precious hours with her new baby. Maternity safety is often compared with airline safety. But this is a mistaken analogy. If there are any concerns about equipment or staffing, a plane can be grounded, simple as that. Maternity isn't like that. Most of our work is unscheduled. Babies arrive regardless of circumstance, day and night. We're juggling life and death decisions where literally every minute counts. When I started as an obstetrician, I was shocked to discover a mere five minutes could be the difference in an emergency between a healthy baby and severe brain damage. I don't even need to make a mistake for guilt to swirl around my head. Any adverse incident is followed by first hospital, then external investigations, statement writing, interviews in front of a panel where you sit dry mouthed being questioned about anything and everything. And then there's the terrifying experience of standing, trembling, under oath at the coroner's court, being questioned. Is it any wonder obstetricians are fearful and risk averse? Focusing in on the safety in this busy and uncertain environment, we can sometimes forget that a poor birth experience can have a significant negative impact on a mother's sense of well-being as well as their relationships with their family. As health professionals, we can use the evidence base as a protective shield to hide behind, yet unable to admit we may be selective, valuing the quantitative, discounting the qualitative. We can end up labelling women as outside of guidance, making them feel reckless and irresponsible if they dare to question our professional recommendations. In our efforts to exert control, we're fooling ourselves, sometimes ending up in conflict, failing to listen to and believe the very people we're aiming to care for and forgetting birth is a truly unique life experience, a truly unique moment. We need to face the fact birth is unpredictable, own up to our limitations. We all want the same thing. If we bring our expertise and our experience to a woman's knowledge of herself, we can join forces to make her birth the best it can be for her and her family. It can be messier and more complicated to, do, to change and do something that feels right for each woman. I think people see me as quirky, eccentric and indulge me. Sometimes members of the team refer to a Florence special. <laughs> I'm accused of being too interested in the fluff, not safety. But it's not safety or experience, it's both that count. And there's ample evidence of a direct correlation between the two. 
I get contacted by doctors and midwives for advice and support because they want to follow suit but are meeting resistance. If we all club together, imagine how powerful that could be. We need to be brave. How we're currently working just isn't good enough. Now more than ever is the time to step up and help more women find the sweet spot, not safety or experience, nor baby versus mother, but safety and experience, baby and mother, to help facilitate a safe birth and a positive birth for as many mothers and babies as possible.